The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seventh installment of the Better Buildings Summer Webinar Series. So in the series, we are profiling the best practices of Better Buildings Challenge and Alliance partners and other organizations working to improve energy efficiency in their buildings. We hope you will join us next week for our final summer webinar and stay tuned for more information on our 2020 to 2021 webinar series launching this fall. Next slide. So uh, my name is Ryan Livingston and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Um, I'm a program and project manager supporting the US Department of Energy, the Federal Energy Management Program and also an account manager for the Better Buildings Data Center Challenge and Accelerator. And we're gonna be talking more about that momentarily. So first I wanna say thank you for all of you for being on with us today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have a wonderful session prepared and some fantastic speakers uh, that we are going to introduce in just a moment. Next slide, please. So uh, today uh, we will be using uh, an exciting platform called Slido. Uh, it's interactive and we will uh, be utilizing it specifically for Q&A. So um, if you're unfamiliar, I would ask you to go to www.slido.com uh, via your uh, mobile connected device um, internet connected device, uh, opening a new window in your browser and going there. Uh, the, the event code for today is going to be hashtag DOE. So the information on the slide here, and I'll give everyone uh, just a moment to navigate to Slido. Okay, so after you enter uh, hashtag DOE on Slido, uh, you will then be brought to the Q&A section. Uh, you can enter any question there at any time during the presentation, and uh, we will be answering those questions near the end of the session. Um, it already appears that uh, some folks may be entering uh, questions or acknowledging that they are indeed in Slido, so thank you. Um, you can also utilize the thumbs up icon for questions, and that will um, shoot them up to the top of the queue. As, uh, as the most popular questions that have been asked. Uh, please note, Slido is a place for any questions to panelists. Um, anyone who wants to enter a question, uh, please use Slido as opposed to the GoToMeeting platform. Again, all, all questions should be utilized uh, via Slido. Uh, we'll also be using Slido con to conduct polls uh, for this afternoon's session. Um, at the top of the website, you'll see another tab right next to Q&A labeled polls. Um, if you select polls, uh, please do that now um, and we'll get to know the poll tab a little bit better. So next slide, please. So our first poll, um, first of four. Uh, the first one is this, it's a scale of one to five. How familiar are you with data centers? One being uh, new to the sector, uh, and the building type, three somewhat familiar, five very familiar. Okay, and this is, this is a live uh, viewing of the Slido poll here. Looks like we're, we, got, we got a nice bell distribution happening. Uh, a lot of folks moderately familiar with data centers and, and that building type. Maybe a few more seconds, uh, see if some more, more responses come in. That's great. Looks like a great distribution for, for our discussion this afternoon. Perfect, thank you for participating, everyone. So to continue with our polls, we're going to move to a second poll in Slido, uh, and that will be, um, so we can get a better idea of what uh, data center uh, you're familiar with and what your organizations uh, have. Uh, so you can uh, provide a response in terms of hyperscale, enterprise, HPC, uh, multi-tenant or colo data centers as they're known sometimes, small data center. I don't know and I don't know, but excited to learn more.
got lots of responses coming in here. This is great. A lot of folks excited. It's perfect. Looks like enterprise, small data centers are well represented, some HPCs and colos as well. Okay, awesome. It looks like folks are are uh, logged on to Slido and grasping the poll feature very well. Thanks, everyone. So thank you for participating in those first two polls. Uh, don't exit out of Slido just yet. We're going to come back to that and take a few more polls here in a moment. But first, uh, let's go to our agenda for this afternoon. So next slide, please. Okay. So before going to our main speakers, um, I want to do again, go through a brief intro and highlight uh, what we will be discussing and uh, on data centers today. So um, after that, we will be going through a framework of uh, making the business case for energy efficiency projects in data centers. That's step number two. And then finally, we'll be hearing about a uh, data center, center accelerator partner uh, who has successfully made the business case for energy efficiency projects in their data centers and has some great results to discuss with us. Finally, we'll be closing out with about 10 minutes or so at the end of today's session uh, for Q&A. Again, um, please provide your questions for the participants uh, this afternoon via Slido. Okay, uh, next slide, please. All right, so Data Center Accelerator, uh, Better Building. So I have the pleasure of announcing some results. Uh, we had 21 partners in, in the Better Buildings Data Center Accelerator who participated in a five-year effort to reduce their infrastructure energy intens intensity in at least one of their data centers. So um, our partners cumulatively on average uh, had a 36% improvement in their infrastructure energy intensity, uh, surpassing the, the accelerator's original goal of 25%. So that improvement result uh, equates to an energy improvement uh, of, in a savings of $3.9 million annually. So big, big improvement there. Um, I'd like to just take a moment and say congratulations and thank you to all our partners who, who participate in the Data Center uh, Challenge and Accelerator and thank them for their, their hard work. Um, although the Accelerator itself has ended and come to a conclusion this time, Better Building is still providing uh, support for, for its partners, including their data center needs. And to that end, uh, we'll go to the next slide. So if you are not currently a Better Building's Challenge partner, uh, we would absolutely encourage you to sign up today. Um, you can receive consultation calls and technical assistance from our subject matter experts and our partners at the national laboratories. So if you're a federal agency, you can also receive assistance from uh, the Federal Energy Management Program on data center related needs. And then lastly, if you have any questions about energy efficiency in your data centers, uh, whether you be a, a Better Buildings Challenge partner, a federal agency, or an organization otherwise, please feel free to reach out to betterbuildingschallenge at ee.doe.gov. Got a few resources there at the bottom for you as well if you'd like to learn more. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll go to our next poll where we can learn a little bit more about you all um, before we turn it over to our first presenter this afternoon. So next slide, please. So next slide is a poll. Okay, poll number three. Um, if you haven't already done so, again, please go to slido.com and enter the, hash, uh, the code for this afternoon, hashtag DOE, uh, so you can participate in our poll here. Um, so this poll is about drivers uh, and your organization and what uh, those drivers might be for helping or hindering you to implement energy efficiency in your data centers. So there's a kind of a wide range of responses there. Let's see what we come up with. Okay, this is looking good, looking good. We're coming up to about a 
hundred responses here. I think we had about 125 the last poll. So we'll give folks a few more moments. But it seems the two responses far and away are reducing energy costs, reducing operating costs, I should say, uh, as a driver um, and saving energy in accordance with organizational values. That's great. That's great to hear. Okay. Increasing reliability and re resilience as well, a popular uh, response that's, that's always an important uh, facet of, of data centers as critical facilities. Okay, so we will talk more about these drivers uh, for energy efficiency projects and data centers in, in a moment, uh, but first we want to do one last poll with you all. So again, uh, slido.com, hashtag DOE, if you've uh, yet to join us in Slido. So last poll here. Um, again, hearing from you, uh, what are the barriers? What are the barriers that have you encountered uh, that have prevented you or your organization from implementing energy efficiency in data centers? Okay, we have some responses coming in. Operating cost of capital. Only have so much money. Okay, great. Mission critical, again, critical facilities, risk averse nature of data centers, makes sense. Okay. Okay, that looks like that's actually, that response is overtaking here as the top barrier slightly. Also, I'd, I'd point out lack of awareness as a popular response, okay. And getting out the knowledge around usage and costs and opportunities for energy efficiency in our data centers. Okay, this is great. Excellent. Well, thank you again, everyone, uh, for participating in this afternoon's poll. This has been really helpful and helped us to identify uh, who all is on the call and how we can best speak to and tailor our message for you this afternoon. Um, we'll be definitely discussing some of these barriers and, and opportunities and, and approaches to overcome them. Okay, next slide, please. Great, so um, here are our presenters for this afternoon. Um, first, we will be hearing from Hannah Stratton with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab presenting on a new resource uh, that helps organizations build the business case for energy efficiency in their data centers. Uh, next, we will uh, be hearing from Jason Morris and Mike Stravel of Los Alamos National Laboratory who have successfully in, implemented an energy efficiency project uh, on their campus that has yielded some, some great results. Uh, lastly, I wanna mention Steve Greenberg here. He's our subject matter expert from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as well. Um, and he'll be joining our Q&A session uh, to answer and to help answer your questions. So um, whether they be easy or, or difficult questions, we'd be happy to, to take a run at them for you. So please feel free to do that and send them in via slido.com. Again, event code, hashtag DOE. Okay, next slide, please. So once more, uh, we are gonna be first uh, hearing from Hannah. Uh, she is a senior research associate uh, for energy efficiency at the Standards Group at Lawrence Berkeley. Uh, she primarily conducts research and provides analytical support for home appliance standards and has worked on projects related to water, water conversation conservation and commercial building efficiency. Prior to joining uh, LBNL, uh, she helped to organize Net Impact's annual sustainability conference. So Hannah, with that, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hannah. Um, and as Ryan mentioned, I'm with Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, Lab Energy Technologies area. And I'm a program manager, and one of my projects is um, um, Center of Expertise for Energy Efficiency in Data Centers. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the drivers, barriers, and stakeholders that are involved in data center energy efficiency projects, and doing, you know, taking a look at this sort of through the lens of a new resource that we created here at the Center of Expertise. And that resource is building the business case for energy efficiency in your data centers. So knowing that you know we have uh, uh, people with diverse backgrounds on the call, 
I just wanted to briefly go over what makes data center energy efficiency unique from um, other energy efficiency projects. Um, we all know that data centers are mission critical organizations. They help they help organizations organizations carry out really distinct their distinct missions. Um, and so, because they are so mission critical, there can be a culture of risk adversity um, for changes, including energy efficiency upgrades. And also, because of its mission critical nature, maintaining continuous uptime is usually the highest priority for data center staff, um, followed by providing capacity for future growth. I think you know we all can think about ways in which our world is increasingly digitized, and really, data centers are the backbone of that. So, you know, these two priorities are probably going to, um, you know, remain numbers one and two, but we also hope that energy efficiency can maybe rank really high up there with those. And, you know, there's a good reason why organizations should look to energy efficiency. Data centers are extremely energy intensive, um, 10 to 100 times more energy intensive than, you know, your typical commercial office space. And so for that reason, there is a really great business case for energy efficiency, they really can um, deliver substantial savings for an organization. So as we kind of move through this webinar, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, the individual context, um, a data center type, organizational structure, internal processes that are in place, uh, maybe previous um, successes or failures with energy efficiency are all going to, of course, play a role in shaping how a project champion um, you know, may shepherd a project through an organization. But really there's just, there's a dynamic, um, you know, there's a unique set of dynamics at play um, that make the barriers, drivers, and stakeholders um, for energy efficiency projects different from energy efficiency projects generally. Uh, next slide, please. So with this in mind, we felt that it would be useful to create a resource that would help organizations, or sorry, help um, project champions kind of cut through the organizational inertia and, um, you know, advance their energy efficiency projects in data centers. So this resource, you know, helps project champions identify drivers that can effectively demonstrate the benefit of energy efficiency in their data center, help them engage and win over key stakeholders, and also anticipate and hopefully overcome some barriers that might be encountered during the project planning and implementation process. Next slide, please. So just to give you a little overview of um, what this resource is, um, it's a new interactive web-based resource where we look at the different drivers um, that were on the polls earlier, as well as the barriers, and kind of link them to the core stakeholders that we typically see engaged in, in an energy efficiency project. So um, currently we have a web PDF version available on our site, but very shortly within the next month, we're going to have this really fun interactive um, web resource where you can sort of break all these things down um, as you wish. And next slide, please. So I just want to just kind of go through each of these different sections of this resource. So you know, first, when we think about drivers, we're just trying to think about, you know, why do people pursue energy efficiency in their data centers? Um, you know, what motivating factors are there? And I know that as um, I think Brian showed earlier, it was reducing operating costs and resiliency ranked, you know, pretty highly. Um, and, you know, there could be other incentives too unique to your organization. But it's really important that project champions think not only about, you know, what the drivers are from where they stand in their organization, but who the key stakeholders are that they need to engage and what their drivers are. And, you know, include that in their pitch for a project and even consider those things also when selecting EPMs, energy conservation measures, and, you know, sort of packaging and marketing um, that project. So just to sort of go through um, briefly the ones that we have covered in this resource, is reducing operating costs, of course, you know, a pretty obvious one, um, you know, freeing up capacity, whether it be floor space, um, cooling and power capacity, uh, or, you know, computing capacity, um, you know, increasing data center reliability and resiliency, which was one that everybody ranks pretty highly, aging infrastructure need of an upgrade. So if your equipment is near the end of its useful life or at the end of its useful life, that can be a great impetus to you know, go ahead and um, replace and upgrade with more energy efficient IT equipment. 
utility and other financial incentives, you know, of course, reducing that upfront capital cost. I think opportunity um, cost of capital was one of our top barriers. So, you know, when there's an opportunity to sort of cost share or um, reduce the cost of a project, that can also be a great opportunity and, you know, something that a project champion can sort of use as leverage for, um, for pursuing a project. And aside from incentives, um, you know, also looking to alternative financing opportunities like energy savings performance contracts. And then another one that I think was ranked pretty highly in the polls here was saving energy in accordance with organizational values. Um, you know, it's probably cliche at this point to say sustainability is a buzzword um, because that's been the case for the last 15 years or so. But, you know, organizations are looking to demonstrate their um, their commitments to sustainability to consumers, um, to their own employees. And, um, you know, so that's another driver. And then lastly, complying with codes and standards. You know, federal agencies have to comply with um, the data center optimization initiative, for example. So, you know, increasingly, um, you know, organizations are looking to efficiency um, for compliance. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a brief kind of look at kind of how this resource is structured. So in the web-based version, you can take a look at the different drivers. It'll map um, and show you which stakeholders are kind of most likely to be maybe driven or really interested in that driver, um, and then just provides kind of a brief, a brief summary. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to give another, so barriers we looked at pretty similarly. Um, and by barriers, we really just mean impediments to a project. And these barriers could be institutional, technical, or financial. Um, and you know, we've all we've listed here the ones that we think are you know most likely to um, come up for a project. But you know, it's a lot, oftentimes these barriers are of course driven by you know valid concerns um, that may be expressed by a certain stakeholder for reasons that are pretty understandable. Um, I know we touched on earlier that there is some risk aversion given the mission critical nature of data centers. And that was actually, I think, maybe the top barrier in the poll. Um, so, you know, oftentimes these are <clears throat> things that, that may kind of, you know, a stakeholder may be worried that it sort of goes against their main job, job, job objective. Um, you know, just to give an example, if an IT manager, um, you know, an IT manager may be hesitant to um, remove comatose servers because perhaps there is a project or some business service that runs on those servers very occasionally that they're not completely aware of. Um, you know, probably an IT manager has never been fired for um, for failing to remove a comatose server, but perhaps they have been fired for removing what they thought was a comatose server, um, and then you know they're being it, it not it not working properly. So. I think you know we have to understand that a lot of these barriers people are coming out with, um, you know, with real um, invalid concerns. So the intention of this barrier section is to give project champions a chance to anticipate and, ident and identify these different barriers so that they can maybe design a project that um, you know have UCMs that won't be um, such an issue for these barriers, or you know pitch the project um, in a way that helps sort of um, mitigate some of these concerns. It also can mean, you know, thinking about these things in the early stages of a project, engaging stakeholders early so that they have a little bit more of a say and that you kind of create some more shared understanding um, of the benefits of the project. And then we also provide um, resources for each of these barriers. So basically a project champion can go in and say, you know, I'm really dealing with issues that there's, that there's a lack of awareness of the current energy, energy usage costs and opportunities, for example. Um, and then we've coalesced a whole bunch of case studies, tools, um, reports, and other resources, trainings, things like that, um, that can help a project champion sort of overcome that, overcome that barrier. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so again, just wanted to give a brief overview of what this looks like. So each barrier describes, you know, what the problem is. Um, an opportunity to overcome the problem, the stakeholders that are probably going to be most likely to voice this barrier or concern, and then resources for the project champion. 
So this one here is that no one person is tasked with energy efficiency, um, which isn't always the case. But you know, sometimes in an organization there is um, there is no person who has this in their job description. So it basically depends on a project champion, you know, taking this upon themselves, setting aside time and effort um, that obviously could or maybe it should be going to something else. Um, no, maybe not should, but that it, you know, they have to find the time in their schedule um, to, you know, facilitate this project. So, um, yeah, so then we give an example of different ways that people can work around that. Um, you know, in this case, maybe it would be going to management and making sure that, you know, it is formally in someone's job description and recognized as, um, you know, an effort that is, that is worth putting in there because maybe it won't get done otherwise. Um, or, you know, creating a cross-functional improvement team to sort of distribute responsibilities and also create a, a you know, a forum for collaboration um, where people can talk about, you know, what the options are. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're sort of getting to the crux of the resource, which is the stakeholders. You know, it's often up to the project champion to proactively engage all these stakeholders in an organization and identify the relevant drivers and frame project benefits in a way that resonates with these stakeholders. And this also can mean identifying and anticipating tension points or conflicts of interest that may come up and framing them in a way that helps mitigate these, um, you know, these barriers. So stakeholders inherently have different responsibilities. I think we touched on that earlier. Um, you know, everyone has their own job to do in an organization. And you know their responsibilities, their concerns, their experiences, and their, their familiarity or lack thereof with energy efficiency and energy efficiency specifically in data centers will all affect how they may perceive a proposed project. So it's really important that um, you know stakeholders use terminology that, uh, sorry, that project champions use terminology that resonates um, with the target stakeholder, um, and also realize that not all stakeholders have equal weight for a project. Um, you know, there are people whose buy-in is really critical and there's others who, you know, maybe you need to keep them in the loop or it would be great to have their support, but they're not um, gonna make or break your project. Next slide, please. So relevant stakeholders will of course vary within each organization, um, but we sort of took a look at who we thought was most likely to be involved in a data center project. So the business case resource speaks to these six stakeholders. Um, and for each of these, you can you know, understand what driver, drivers resonate with these stakeholders, what barriers might I need to overcome to get their buy-in, and you know, what resources are there to help get their buy-in in a project. Um, and I just wanna kind of point out that we spoke, um, you know, we spoke about drivers and barriers kind of generally, but um, this resource also sort of um, tailors drivers and barriers for each of these stakeholders. So we have a, a lot of information on the drivers and barriers specifically for each of these um, each of these stakeholders. And then also, I just wanted to point out that really any of these people can be a project champion. I think it's you know most common that we see a facility manager be a project champion, but um, it could be any one of these people or somebody else in an organization. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give an example, um, stakeholder spotlight. So we're looking here at the facility manager, just to give you guys a little bit more information on the type of content that we have and the resources. So for each of these um, stakeholders, we take a look at their characteristics. And by characteristics, we really mean, you know, what are their, um, you know, what are their objectives and responsibilities relative to data centers? So looking at the facility manager, um, they're probably going to be the most likely project champion. They're responsible for maintaining infrastructure, um, power and cooling needs. They also work to assure data center uptime and recoverability. And very importantly, they have to accommodate capacity needs coming from an IT manager or CIO. They're also the most likely to pay or at least see a data center's energy bill. Um, I believe that there was a survey, I think about 80% or maybe two thirds, of, at least over two thirds of organizations, um, the facility manager is the one who pays the bill. So just kind of considering this context that they have, you know, um, what are the drivers for them for energy efficiency? 
well, of course, reducing operating costs. If they're the ones paying the bill, then they're probably going to be pretty motivated by that driver. Um, freeing up capacity, you know, freeing up capacity can allow them, um, you know, more space, more floor space, power um, and cooling capacity. And also it allows them to fulfill one of their main kind of job functions, which is being able to accommodate an organization's growth um, and, you know, meet the needs of their IT department. Additionally, they're often tasked with complying with codes and standards. So that's another um, important driver for a facility manager, most likely. And then lastly, you know, depending on, you know, where the project funds are coming from, you know, if they're coming from a facility fund, then um, utility and other financial incentives, as well as alternative financing opportunities like ESPCs, you know, could be a really important driver for the facility manager. And then similarly, looking at the barriers that they have, because they are, you know, maybe the most likely project champion, um, they might be the ones who have to work to try to align stakeholder interests and, you know, cut through that organizational inertia and really develop a pitch and a business case for each of these stakeholders. Um, and then similarly, if nobody is tasked with energy efficiency, but they're kind of the ones that take it on, um, you know, a project is more likely to fall through the cracks. Um, so that's an important barrier that they'll have to overcome, which is, you know, finding the resources um, to devote to the project. And then lastly, um, lack of awareness of energy usage, costs and opportunities. You know, facility manager is probably paying the energy bill and maybe seeing it and, um, you know, some of them may be well informed on what the opportunities really are with energy efficiency in data centers, but others may not. So, um, you know, they'll have to take it upon themselves to, um, you know, to maybe take a training um, or something like that. And even if, you know, they're familiar with the opportunities, they're probably going to be trying to engage a lot of people, especially at the management level, that simply are not very, um, you know, well informed. So they have to kind of expect to do a certain level of information, um, information exchange and education. Next slide, please. So just wanted to give you a view of what it looks like, um, what the research looks like. So for each stakeholder, we have information on their roles and responsibilities relative, relative to data centers, drivers, barriers, and then um, resources targeted towards that stakeholder. So, you know, we have some good resources on, you know, why the CFO really should be engaged with an IT department. Um, sometimes there are things that the project champion themselves can use to kind of win over that stakeholder, but sometimes there, um, there are tools or documents that are really geared towards that specific stakeholder that kind of shows them, you know, um, why they should care about data center energy efficiency. And next slide, please. So some key takeaways uh, is that, you know, data center energy efficiency projects can require a really concerted and coordinated effort. Um, you know, of course, this is going to change. People are going to have different experiences in their organization based on a whole host of variables. But, um, you know, sometimes it takes a lot. Uh, to, it can take establishing a cross-functional improvement team or like writing this into someone's job description to make sure that it really, um, you know, gets done. So project champions should, you know, look at really who in the organization they need to engage and, you know, try to think about how the project that they're proposing kind of, um, you know, advances certain drivers um, and, you know, anticipate what barriers um, they, may, they may encounter. And they also should take the initiative to share information and educate others and, you know, definitely should not assume familiarity with the topic, especially as, you know, they're moving up, um, you know, to the C-suite or management level. You know, those people are concerned with a lot of other things and not to say that they shouldn't care, but you're going to have to, you know, clearly articulate to them why they care and speak to them, um, you know, on their terms. Also, early engagement of stakeholders and establishment of a cross-functional team um, can really help facilitate mutual understanding and achieve buy-in and provide you know, a good forum and also a distribution of responsibilities. And, you know, developing and presenting the project in a way that leverages key stakeholder interests um, and addresses or mitigates their concerns is important. You know, um, you know, you can't expect to make them maybe the same pitch to the IT manager as you do the CFO or the CEO. 
And then also just wanted to point out that measuring project outcomes can pave the way for future projects. Um, you know, it's important to maybe document your process and also measure before you implement your project. Of course, you can actually track your improvements so that hopefully, um, you know, when it's a success, that can help, um, you know, help kind of grease the wheels for maybe the next to the next project that you undertake. And so, you know, I was only sort of able to cover our, our resource here at a high level, but we've aggregated a lot of good information for everyone um, in our business case resource, and we hope that it can pass that it can help project champions on their path um, towards data center energy efficiency. Um, and again, that's available for download on our website and um, we have our interactive resource um, coming soon. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Hannah. Uh, that was excellent information. I think a very valuable resource uh, for the folks with us this afternoon. So as a quick reminder, uh, please go to slido.com and enter any questions you might have there, again, using the event code hashtag DOE, and we will get to as many of those as possible during the Q&A session at the end of today's uh, presentation. So um, thanks again, Hannah. Moving forward, we're gonna transition to Jason and Mike at Los Alamos National Laboratories. So um, real quickly about those Guys, uh, Jason currently works as the Information and Technology Program Manager for Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, as a member of the Network Infrastructure and Engineering Division uh, and team. Uh, he accomplishes strategic management of many laboratory uh, information technology systems uh, to include the data center. So his primary background is from the United States Air Force, where he spent over 20 years working with airborne networks, radar systems, information systems, and virtual war warfare simulation. Very cool. Uh, we will also hear from Mike as well, uh, who's a project manager in the high performance computing, uh, the HPC at Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's been managing the advanced technology projects there for decades. Uh, his recent projects have included designs for highly, a highly efficient supercomputer data center, uh, as well as the consolidation of several old data centers and closets. Uh, quickly, Mike has a BS in ele electrical engineering uh, from the United States Air Force Academy uh, and a master's in industrial engineering and management from North Dakota State University and a master's and PhD in electrical engineering and high performance computing uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. So, Jason and Mike, over to you guys. All right, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Ryan. Appreciate you uh, inviting us in and uh, having the uh, great introduction there. We really appreciate that. Uh, again, my name is uh, Jason Morris. Uh, if I'm looking back in fourth years because I'm sharing uh, two screens and I'm trying to kind of juggle uh, what I'm looking at with my slides, so uh, apologies in advance if I'm not making direct eye contact with the camera. Uh, so as, uh, as Ryan mentioned, uh, my background's with the U.S. Air Force, uh, kind of at a high level. I've got some experience with data centers in multiple different environments out there, uh, from deserts to, uh, to, to higher altitudes and, and things of that nature. And kind of the one thing that I really took away from that experience is how much the outside environment can affect the inside efficiency of a data center. And we'll kind of talk about that here today. And again, to reiterate what Ryan said, I've been with Los Alamos National Laboratory since 2017 with network and infrastructure engineering, kind of doing the business side of management for some of our business type of data centers. And Mike works the high performance side, and I'll turn it over to Mike for a few seconds to talk about his background. That's right. Well, we're excited to present some energy efficient conceptual designs that we developed to provide our senior management some alternatives between uh, making upgrades to existing facilities versus building a new data center. Jason. All right, great. Thanks, Mike. Next slide. Okay, here's what we're going to talk about during our time here today. We're going to look at our data center strategic management. PUE monitoring, some infrastructure upgrades, and environmental advantages, and just to kind of expound on those real quick. So data center strategic management, when I came to the lab in 2017, this was my first task, was to uh, kind of get our data center centralized in a management uh, functional format that we could use to effectively make things uh, more energy efficient. Uh, and I've got a kind of a funny story with that that I'll talk about during that portion of the uh, briefing. Uh, next, we're gonna talk about PUE monitoring. 
Uh, for most folks who know, PUE is the big metric for managing uh, data center uh, efficiency and effectiveness, and it's definitely something we want to keep an eye on. So we'll, we'll speak to that a little bit. We'll also discuss some uh, infrastructure upgrades that we're looking at doing and that we have done in some of our data centers. Uh, some of our buildings are quite uh, high tech and some of our buildings are quite low tech and older. And we'll kind of touch on the uh, the mix and match that we deal with uh, here at Los Alamos in particular. And then finally, we'll discuss environmental advantages, again, hitting on what I just talked about, which is the outside environment very much affects the inside uh, efficiency of a data center, uh, no matter uh, where you're at. So if you're in a desert, your data center may not be very efficient or effective. Uh, whereas up here at Los Alamos, we have a nice uh, semi-arid environment that uh, gives us kind of some help with efficiency. Next slide. Okay, so talking about strategic management. So uh, to kind of kick things off with a story, when I arrived here in 2017, again, I was told, you know, Jason, you know, we need to centralize the management of our data centers. We have a lot of data centers here at Los Alamos. Uh, we have closets uh, that are made for storage that are being used to hold servers. We have trailers, we have uh, high-tech buildings, we have lots of stuff out here. So, so try to get this stuff uh, under control. So what I immediately did was I took the list that we did have. I worked with a lot of different uh, stakeholders out there, primarily with folks who run networks and servers, and we started just kind of tracing out uh, where are our data centers located at, where are all these little rooms. Uh, if someone has a scientific project, uh, they want a nice little closet that they can put their server in so they don't have to deal with a lot of the overhead that comes with trying to get uh, data center space. Uh, well, things have kind of changed over the years. Um, I'll speak to that a little bit more, but we now have the uh, infrastructure on demand uh, capability that helps us pull in uh, a lot of those little uh, desperate servers and data centers out there. But the most interesting thing I found was there was one data center on my list that nobody could find. Uh, it turns out this data center was in a trailer. Uh, it had been for a number of years, and the trailer had since been uh, dispositioned. It was no longer with the lab, and we had been reporting on it for, uh, I think, two or three years uh, as an active data center when, in fact, it was no longer in existence. So always good to take a look at the books and dust off, uh, you know, uh, kind of check things out, uh, make sure things haven't gotten too uh, neglected. Uh, at least once a year annually, kind of take a look at your inventory, make sure it's as accurate as possible. Uh, another thing we look at with the, uh, in, in, in accordance with the, uh, the list of data centers there is our procurements. Uh, FATARA requirements for, for folks who aren't familiar with FATARA, it's the uh, Federal IT uh, Acquisition Regulation, basically wanting to, us to make all of our procurements more efficient. A specific uh, aspect of FATARA is that we can't expand our data centers without a darn good reason to expand them. And if we do an expansion, it needs to be uh, well thought out and, and made as energy efficient as possible. Uh, for instance, you know, we found out some folks the other day we're going to take a closet attached to a data center, put some heating and cooling in there, throw in some servers, and expand out their data center. And we had to take a second and look at that and make sure we weren't going to violate FITAR as a result. And it turns out we were not, so uh, everybody was happy at the end of the day. Uh, but in line with that, we, we have a, a system set up here at the lab where we can do a data center expansion notification through our uh, permits and projects uh, regulation system where if anybody's going to do anything to a data center, it kicks off a flag and we go through a review process and make sure that we're meeting uh, the intent of FATARA. We also do consolidation planning. So like I said, we traced out our infrastructure, found a lot of closets and other areas out there, and we started building a plan to consolidate these closets into infrastructure on demand. Uh, we found out that our, our scientific stakeholders who are the, the customers uh, building these small little rooms uh, really enjoyed infrastructure on demand. This, what basically it is, is it's a portion of our data center that we've carved out and we've loaded it up with storage and uh, networking uh, capability, uh, or I should say processing capability. Uh, what this means is that someone who needs a data center now doesn't have to go out and buy servers, see if they're cyber secure, get them put on the network, and then load them into our data center. Everything, the infrastructure is already there. They just have to come in and request the processing time and the storage space. And our stakeholders who are scientists really love that because now they don't have to, to uh, spend money on a uh, admin or somebody like that to come in and actually manage their, uh, their hardware. So uh, it's really been a very effective tool for consolidation planning, uh, giving a venue for folks to close down their little data centers, shut those, and bring it into a formally managed and cyber secure facility. Then we have our new data center planning where we plan out our, our new data centers and, and hopefully make these as energy efficient as possible. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to discuss our new data center planning. Mike. 
as we were evaluating our requirements for new data centers, specifically for power and cooling, you, we can go to the next slide. Um, we wanted to give our management a choice between upgrading existing data centers or building a new data center. So we developed a fairly detailed conceptual design of a new highly efficient data center. And you can see a picture of that on the right, a, a sketch. The gray building that looks kind of shiny is the actual data center uh, that houses the supercomputer. The tan building in the front provides some small drop-in office space and mechanical uh, cooling and pumps. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, we see uh, an array of adiabatic dry coolers. That's about the size of a football field, and we'll go into more detail on that. Uh, in between the data center and the adiabatic dry coolers, we can see some uh, what are uh, fan walls for outside air cooling. And then on the right side of the picture, you can see some outside transformers that reduce the power from 13,000 volts down to the 600 volts that we'll be using on future supercomputers. So this data center has both uh, low power usage uh, effectiveness, um, low, low number, high effectiveness, and it's very efficient at water usage efficiency, it uses very little water. The supercomputer that goes into this building uses warm water cooling, and uh, it uses hybrid dry coolers to reduce the temperature, to reject the heat to the outside, it does not have any chillers, so everything's done with the hybrid dry coolers. Uh, there's most of the heat is rejected with the hybrid dry coolers and the warm water cooling, but there's still a small amount of heat that comes out of the cabinets when you're looking at a 40 megawatt data center that adds up. So you still have to have some airflow through your data center, and we use outside air cooling for that. The rectangular shape provides a longer wall to provide enough air going into the facility, as well as shortening the distance to the outside transformers on the right side there. The One of the benefits, so frequently we'll hear about the advantages of locating the transformers close to the computer racks, perhaps underneath or in the, on the other side of a wall in the building, but there's also benefits to locating the transformers outside. Again, transformers have waste heat associated with them. So if we can use free air cooling for that waste heat from the transformers, then we don't have to pay to uh, reject that heat to the outside. And the other thing is this uh, whole building is immediately adjacent to a high power substation and uh, that reduces our cost as well. And we'll talk a little more about that. Next slide. So that let's look in a little more detail at the concept of outside air cooling. So starting in the lower left-hand corner of that figure, the green arrow represents outside air that's coming in to the data center. It's uh, pumped uh, into the, uh, flooded into the data center, and then we have hot aisle containment represented by the red arrows that uh, takes the heat out to the hot air exhaust as you follow that red arrow to the left, and that's exhausted outside. Now, in really cold temperatures, we can warm the air going into the data center in the winter time, for example, by mixing some of the hot air exhaust uh, in with the outside air. Or if it's uh, really hot uh, for a small percentage of our days, we can use uh, warm water uh, from the adiabatic dry coolers to slightly cool the air coming into the data center. Uh, it turns out we can use the outside air economizer uh, for 85% of the annual hours. Now, one of the things to recognize with outside air cooling is that it's difficult to retrofit that into an existing building due to the high air flows that are required. All right, next slide. Let, let's talk a little bit about the environment. So the important thing is to be sustainable for your environment. 
Uh, we're all located in different environments. Some people are in hot, humid temperatures. Other people are in deserts. We happen to be in the mountains. We have a ski area just outside of town. You can see in this aerial photo of uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, some mountains in the background and the ski area is up there. So it's certainly cool in the winter time and uh, it's also uh, relatively cool in the summer. We have slightly warm afternoons, but it cools down and again in the evenings. So it's mainly those summer afternoons that we have to devise clever strategies uh, for cooling our warm water. It's also very low humidity here. So while evaporative cooling towers work very well, water is also a valuable resource here in the Southwest where we're located in New Mexico. So we try to be sensitive to the community and conserve those water resources, even though the lab itself does have ample water rights. So it turns out that we can use the dry coolers and outside air for 85% of the hours in the year without needing to use water at all. Next slide. Jason also mentioned consolidation. So one of the other projects that we've worked on recently is developing this conceptual design for converting a 1960s era data center to offices. This building was originally built to house the IBM Stretch computer uh, in the early 60s, and it's about 32,000 square feet total. And what we were finding is that there was not enough power or cooling in this building uh, for today's high performance computing systems, but there was lots of space. So we consolidated uh, uh, in this design all the computing into that upper right-hand corner, and that became the uh, remaining space for computing. And then we designed office space for the other three quarters of the building, the 24,000 square feet. Uh, the office space doesn't require very much power or cooling, uh, but we have a shortage of office space, and this is right in the center of our main uh, area at the lab. So it's a uh, high value real estate uh, that can be used uh, more effectively for offices now. Next slide, Jason. All right, thanks, Mike. So to talk uh, real quick about PUE monitoring, uh, with regards to some of our stakeholders. So as Mike mentioned, some of our buildings are older 1960s type uh, buildings. Uh, as a result, uh, some of their infrastructure was constructed with uh, low accessibility uh, piping. Uh, HVAC systems were built uh, in a way that weren't very accessible. So right now we're trying to find uh, ways of censoring uh, some of these systems, uh, kind of uh, retrofitting them, if you will, using sonic sensors to, uh, to look at some water flow and things of that nature. Um, all of this is to, to go for PUE monitoring. We want to monitor how much energy is coming in versus how much energy is getting used in a, and put back out into the environment there as well. Um, I listed on here a couple of obstacles to implementation. These aren't obstacles in the negative light. They're obstacles in the sense that they're challenges. So, like I said, we have some dated infrastructure here. But the other thing also is cybersecurity. We want to make sure that anytime we're doing censoring or if we're putting any kind of PUE monitoring at a rack level, that uh, any kind of data feeds or networking that we're doing is, uh, is definitely passing the cybersecurity test. Uh, those do offer a uh, threat vector that we want to be aware of whenever we're doing uh, any kind of PUE monitoring. So just something to be aware of uh, kind of as you press ahead into uh, the world of PUE monitoring out there. And to discuss uh, PUE uh, monitoring in detail, I'll turn it back over to Mike. So the next slide is an example of a PUE dashboard that we are developing right now for one of our big supercomputer centers. This is called a Sankey diagram, and the different streams represent the flow of energy. So we're bringing 15 megawatts in from the grid. The uh, top three streams represent our IT load, about 12 megawatts. And then the green stream and the first uh, red stream represent the non-IT load. So the IT load is our Trinity, our big supercomputer, uh, commodity technology system one, and uh, also network and storage, and then chillers and pumps and fans, lights and plugs are the non-IT load. So in, in this example, 
our PUE works out to about 1.23, which is not bad for an older data center, but it doesn't keep up with the most modern data centers without chillers. Jason, next slide. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, next slide. I got an infrastructure upgrade. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing some uh, electrical updates in order to make things a little bit more energy efficient. Um, we're also looking at more energy efficient IT gear, such as servers, uh, and increasing our processing density out there as well. We already discussed uh, infrastructure on demand earlier. Uh, that does help us uh, keep things very efficient in that we're using very uniform uh, equipment, uh, and, and the people trained to use it, we only have to train one person versus training one person on two or three different systems, which takes time and, and effort and uh, uses up uh, cycles in the workday. So we're trying to work on not only energy efficiency, but also uh, worker and workload efficiency uh, as well. But like I said, the infrastructure on demand has been a pretty huge uh, winner for us uh, as far as our uh, business owners and our scientific customers, as well as, as our platform owners out there as well, folks who are uh, maintaining a platform of software and need to uh, provide a, uh, a service out to a customer. Next slide. The next slide is a picture of adiabatic dry coolers, which can be used to maximize water savings. They, uh, in the picture on the left, you can see what, what an actual adiabatic dry cooler looks like, and the right is a diagram showing how it works. The big advantage of this is it uses very little water in our climate, about one eighth of the water required for an evaporative cooling tower. Um, the uh, disadvantage is it's about twice as expensive as an evaporative cooling tower and takes up uh, about uh, six times more square footage. So as I mentioned before, the, for a 40 megawatt data center, it takes a football field full of adiabatic dry coolers to accomplish the water savings. Next slide. So some of the key energy efficiency takeaways for you are, first of all, take advantage of your own weather condition to uh, achieve compressorless cooling. Anticipate your future cooling system transitions. I saw there was a question about li liquid cooling. A lot of data centers have started out with air cooling, then moved to chilled water cooling, and will probably be moving to warm water and hot water cooling in the future. So to think about what systems you're gonna need in your future data centers as you just design them. As I mentioned, it's valuable if you can bring your computers to the power rather than having to run megawatts worth of power to the computers, you can save a lot of capital costs and uh, reduce the uh, power losses from those cables. The adiabatic dry coolers significantly reduce water consumption and it's important to integrate your data center with your long-term site plan. That concludes the energy efficiency concepts. Next slide. Uh, feel free to call Jason or I, uh, or send us an email if you have any questions. Um, and I've also put in a, a link to the uh, energy efficient HPC working group, which is free for anyone to join. Okay. Right, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mike. Um, I know we're quickly approaching the top of the hour here, but wanted to maybe get in a question or two before quickly reviewing some of the recap slides uh, and additional resources for you all. So thanks for hanging, hanging in there with us here at the end. Um, I wanted to also introduce Steve Greenberg. Uh, he's on the call with us. He's from Lawrence Berkeley as well and a senior energy management engineer uh, from the lab. He's researched applied energy efficiency for buildings and industrial systems for a variety of clients um, over the past 37 years. So his uh, data center experience and engineering with data centers uh, spans over 20 years um, and includes data centers ranging from server closets to supercomputers in excess of 15 megawatts as, as they're looking at for Los Alamos. So um, we're glad to have Steve with us. So Thank you everyone uh, and all our presenters for speaking today. I'll quickly, uh, I guess, ask one question of Steve here to uh, that point that I just made in his bio. Um, what Steve uh, is typically considered um, a data center? Does it include smaller servers and IT rooms at a facility that don't have dedicated uh, servers as well? What's the range? 
Yeah, so absolutely, it includes all those. Um, a, a big issue um, with small data centers is they're Im embedded in other buildings and that poses challenges of sorting out how much energy is, is going to what part of the facility. Um, there's an ASHRAE definition of data centers, which is 10 kilowatts of uh, infrastructure technology load or server load um, and, um, and 20, 20 watts per square foot. Tw yeah, 20 watts per square foot of floor area. So you can have a single rack of servers that meets the, that definition of data center. So the short answer is yes and yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, I wanted to also just provide a quick question uh, to Hannah as well. Uh, someone was curious about what was the tool that you were discussing? What is that called and where can they find it? Yes, so um, the tool is called Building the Business Case for Energy Efficiency in Data Centers. Um, and you can find that at the Center of Expertise for Energy Efficiency in Data Centers at uh, datacenters.lbl.gov. Um, and it's actually going to be on the um, resources slide as well, so you can find it there from this slide deck that will be sent out, I believe. Perfect. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Heaven and Steve. Thanks, everyone, for staying on again. I know uh, we have an abridged Q&A version today, but we really appreciate it. I'll quickly, with that great segue, go to some additional resources slides. So we have some additional resources here put together uh, by today's presenters. Um, specifically the COE at LBL uh, for energy efficiency and data centers. So there's some great links and uh, information there for you to follow. I also want to give a shout out, as Mike mentioned, uh, the Energy Efficiency HPC Working Group. Again, that's open to anyone to join. You don't have to be a national lab or a federal entity to do so. So please feel free to check out uh, their uh, resources as well. Next slide. We have the e-learning center also uh, with Better Buildings. It's an on-demand library of webinars and other programs uh, that Better Buildings has put on. Uh, it has resources uh, and a range of relevant uh, solutions for, for the Better Buildings uh, partners uh, there. So please uh, go check that out, including the Solution Center. Next slide. Lastly, I want to mention uh, our summer webinar series. Again, uh, this is the 7th of 8th, so the penultimate webinar for us here today. Um, all previous webinars are recorded and are available on demand, as, as this one will be as well. So please go and check those out. Uh, and this is the, <laughs> the last webinar in the series, succeeding with submetering. Again, uh, it's free to register, and we would hope that you do so. Uh, lastly, this is our Better Building Solution Center here, um, a little bit of a, a quick tutorial on how it works. But again, um, all Better Building's partners put together solutions that are then put onto the Solution Center for the benefit of everyone hoping to learn about uh, energy efficiency and ways to maximize their facilities. Lastly, I'll go to the close. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, in any way at the emails there or at the uh, links provided on the left. Uh, we'd be more than happy to get to some of the questions that we were able, uh, unfortunately unable to get to today. Thank you for joining uh, and thanks again to all of our fantastic panelists for the information and resources they shared with us this afternoon. We hope to see you again uh, at another Better Building Summer Webinar Series and feel free to be interactive with us on things like Twitter, uh, in the future. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon.